to the big city First I didn't get very far I was a student but barely with it Good luck doesn't care who you are I was all over the place So wasted but you fell for my wicked ways Which makes my move to the big city Best decision I ever made one, two, what, just that guy on its own? Yeah. Yeah, that does work. Just, um, just four, four podcasts you're talking about. Oh, I just did one. You've done one of you. Yeah. You've started. Uh, so can I get you to... Well, pull, no, I was interviewing a guy your chair for and... a documentary I was I was doing, and I thought I'd record it all as well, just in case I wanted to release it as a podcast. There you go. One, two, 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 yes. Yeah! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Bring him down a touch. Okay. Uh, happy birthday, Jack. Thank you very much. Welcome on to Life in the Stocks. This Cheers. has been a long time coming. Today <laughs> is the day of your birth. I've yeah. got to ask you, you should never ask a gentleman. How old? I'm 29. Jeez. I'm clinging on for dear life to my 20s. Mate, you're still in them, though. That's, yeah, that's more than I can say. Like it. The 20, the 20s don't want anything to do with me. The 30s, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> you're in, in no man's land. <laughs> That's yeah. five years I've got on you. Then I'm 34 this year, and so much wiser than me. I've well, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I've been reading your articles, <laughs> mate. And you've opened my mind to a lot of serious discourse and discussions that I hope we can we can get into momentarily. Yeah. Uh, I want to take it back to your childhood, though, okay. and and get some kind of Northern Yorkshire colour. Um, where did you grow up? You were telling me a moment ago it was in Teesside, right? Well, I was I was uh, I grew up in a town called Richmond, North Yorkshire, which is a tiny sleepy lovely little town was it, it rural or was it more it's rural yeah urban it's rural and it has problems you know like everywhere does but it's uh it's beautiful beautiful and really scenic so people go there for weddings uh but there's you, a lot of unemployment is there uh there is some or unemployment what, it's, it's, it's a weird it's a weird thing so like because it, it, it's right next to county durham and and like teesside kind of areas and so there's just a big, uh, there's a lot of inequality with wealth and opportunity. So uh, when you go over to Teesside and Stockton on Tees, which where a lot of my family are from, all of my family are from, where my dad lives, um, there's just a, a lot of disparity between uh, the rich and poor, or those who have opportunities and those who don't, addiction, all that kind of thing. So is there not really a middle class? Is it just you're either well, sort of a honest- land baron? Or your working class or lower class. There's a lot of landowners, and then I guess it's. I think I, th- I don't think this class system is three classes anymore. I was reading that it's uh, up to seven. Even okay. More. So do they all have definitive terms? They do, but I can't remember. You can't what they name are. them all. <laughs> I can't remember what they are. So so it's hard. But to you're basically comment. talking upper middle, lower middle. Yeah, that that kind of thing. Subcategories of class. Exactly. So it's probably lower middle class. So were your folks wealthy? Were you a well-off family? Were you working um, class? What I, was the economic situation in the Hutchcraft family household? Really, really, my family come from working class uh, backgrounds, and um, and I grew up in a single parent family. So it was me, my mum, and my brother, and then we used to see our dad at the weekends. Uh, How old were you when your folks divorced? I was one. Okay. So I can't remember them together. Uh, it, that seems abstract to me to think of them together. Yeah. You know, I've never seen them together. So looking at pictures is kind of strange, you know. Um, Are they friends? Are they civil? Uh, they speak when they need to, yeah. They, yeah. They, they, they don't dislike each other. And and then I've got two sisters um, who grew up with my dad. Right. So they're stepsisters, half-sisters. Half-sisters, yeah. but they're my sisters. Yeah. I like that. There's n- <laughs> there's no division. Exactly. And then no you division. and your brother are biological brothers. You grew up with your mum. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And we're best friends as well. So that's just lucky, really. And your whole family, um, I knew your brother was a musician already. Yeah. He's in Hertz. But you were just telling me one of your sisters is a costume designer, works on The Crown. Yeah, that's right. Another one's in fashion. Yeah, absolutely. So, so just a super creative yeah, household I- across both households. Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking about this on the way here. Yeah, it is really, really creative. And I think what my mum, I'm, I'm blessed. I've got three parents, you know, sometimes with, with, um, the glass is half full. Yeah, exactly. Divorces, things can be half full and, and and people, and it it doesn't always work out this way for everybody. 
Um, but me, I've got three parents. Some people don't have any parents. How lucky am I? I've got my mum, my, my dad and my stepmom. And because um, she's been in my life, you know, almost my entire life. And they, they gave us something. And it wasn't a lot of money, but they gave us something that is invaluable, which is the belief. Well, this is, I can speak for myself. The belief that we could do anything. I can do anything. So was that instilled in you from a young age? You distinctly remember that being a... A yeah. message that you were sort of given and you took on Absolutely. and you were encouraged to think and feel that way. Still to this day, if I wanted to beatbox, if I wanted to be a ballet dancer, if I wanted to work in construction, whatever it is, I had support. So I'm so, so lucky. And even to this day, you know, my mum's our biggest fans, you know, she mm-hmm. will watch TV and she'll just be like, you should be doing that. You could do that if you want. You could be an actor. You could do this. You could do that. And it's amazing because it's it's... At the time, you didn't realise it, but these are building blocks that have, have built my character. Yeah, and that's absolutely. that's where it, through, I've done a lot of youth work in my adult life. You know, majority of my adult life is spent working with young people in some capacity, usually teenagers, 14 to 18. Um, and Traditionally troubled? Well, you know, from all different backgrounds. A lot, of Lon- a lot of London kids, a lot of inner city London kids and from North and East London and even Brixton and all over the place. But they... Um, but that's what I tried to pass on a little bit. You know, I'm not, I'm obviously not their carer, but I tried to pass on just an ounce of what my parents gave me, which was, you can do anything. So we, we, we sit and listen to the radio. These lads that I'm working with, they've got music on, you know, music on the radio. You could do that. Why don't you make your own songs? Why don't you, you like clothes, you wear clothes. Everyone wears clothes. Why don't we make our own clothes? You know, why don't we... And these are just creative things. But, you know, you watch football, let's play football, let's start, you know, join the league and all this kind of thing. And I think that's a massive barrier to a lot of people. And it only exists within our head. You know, I'm not saying everyone can be really successful, but I'm saying... You can give uh, it a go and you don't know until you try. you can have a hell of a lot of fun doing it. Well, even if you fail, there's joy in the the task and the attempt. Absolutely, 100%. 100%. And so these barriers only exist within our mind. And it's a shame a lot of people have them right through their adult, adult life thinking, you know, I don't do music. Hey, I'm not musical at all. That's you, not me. Well, you listen to a lot of music, yeah. you know. Uh, it all comes from somewhere. That, that, that's, um, so yeah, that's one thing I try. That's one thing I have, which is a, a self-confidence, I guess, with, with things. And I'm not the best at everything, but I do, for a long time, I, I, you know, I'm a writer and I make music, both at very low levels. I wouldn't do that if I wasn't passionate about it and have optimism for myself and my personal development and that's where it's come from so i <laughs> to jump into a weird topic but go with me on let's it let's go yeah i wasn't familiar with satanism in any form right okay until i did a podcast with my dear friend johnny doom about a year and a half ago and he was sort of giving me the basics on it and then i've just read this article which you wrote on the relationship between climate change and religion mm-hmm. and what figures from basically every major you know, theological school of thought had to say. And I was reading the the Satanist guy's words, yeah. um, and or the Satanist guy might be a very loose term to apply to him, but whatever yeah. his role in that church was. And he was saying the big thing in Satanism is empowerment, mm-hmm. self-belief. Yeah. And I find that really fascinating, and I, I want to learn more about that as a, a, you know, a spirituality and, a, mm-hmm. and an approach to life, because I think the... The sort of ignorant view is that you just, you know, you like blood and sacrificing goats and you worship the devil and all of this. And it wasn't until I spoke to Johnny, I read this article of yours. That's my basic introductory level knowledge of of this area. But is that right, that the the general sort of themes in that religion is autonomy, love yourself, like you you can do anything you want? Is that a big part of it? Well, from what I understand, I'm no, I'm no expert, but the yeah the guy I interviewed he ran the Global Order of Satan, and they were once part of the Satanic Temple. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to speak uh, cautiously because you I can... don't know how much I'm supposed to say. Okay, because I, um, I, we'll I think dance some, around I think some the subject. Of what I, think some of what I told me was off the record, basically. But they used to be part of the Satanic Temple, and there's a documentary about these guys who are American. I've seen it called Hail Satan. Yeah, yeah, I've seen so it. So those guys are part of this this British group as well. And they're all, and yeah, they're very much believers in, in, in science 
and kind of offering an antithesis to um like a like a monotheistic there's definitely an, an anti-authoritarian oh, totally. flavor in there as well isn't there to- totally totally and i think that's Which what kind of sits well with me as well <laughs> yeah. yeah it's punk man <laughs> uh so so that's exactly what he said and his 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 answer was so refreshing so i asked him about you know what is the satanic or the global order of satan what is their viewpoint on climate change and he was basically like well ours is much the same as extinction rebellions and you know action needs to happen now there's no god that's going to save us because they're an atheist religion his particular group and there is different types of satanism who do get into that darker murkier kind of stuff levain satanism for example i think is a little bit more is that doctrine. is it a world you know much about it isn't actually no i'd love to go in on it with you <laughs> not the kind of weird sacrificial end I know, but yeah. I just because I was speaking to Johnny in relation to mental health and depression and areas like this, yeah. And he was saying that a lot of that school of thought that he learnt in the eighties when he was studying and reading and immersing himself in mm-hmm. Satanism, he's applied when he is feeling suicidal or depressed. Like you've got to give yourself the tools to get through the bad times, and yeah. that's where that kind of self love <laughs> that Satanism preaches comes from. Yeah, is absolutely. giving yourself like strength of the mind and the the PMA, if yeah. you will, it is to get through the bad times. It's definitely, and that's only a positive viewpoint. thing, right? It, it is. It is. As a human, as humanists, as well as humanism, uh, of which I was going to get involved in the article as well. But they, their, their viewpoint was really similar to say, Satan. These Satanist guys I spoke to, but they basically, interestingly, they've got like a bad rep because of all this, you know, horror story stuff and you know, sacrificial. Mm-hmm. Uh, no. Well, here's a funny story, dude. On New Year's Eve, I was sat with my friend, I won't say his name, but we were tripping on magic mushrooms right. <laughs> in Hampstead Heath waiting for the sun to come up. And we got onto the subject of like happiness and joy and obviously depression. And we're just talking yeah. about everything as you do when you're tripping on mushrooms. And I was trying to explain to him how Satanism is this thing that, you know, is about self. And he's like, dude, don't be talking to me about devil worshipping <laughs> in a dark forest when we're tripping out. And it, I was like, no, 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 but it's, no, it's out, not man. like that. You've got to hear me out. And he's like, no, I don't want to fucking just picture in my head yeah. Satan and the horns and hell. And, and it, it has that, doesn't it? It has such stigma and bad negative connotations to it. Totally. Well, so I, I, I spoke to a guy from the Humanist Society, I think they were called. And I was like, he was going to do the interview and he, he was a little bit late replying. So I said, it's okay. I've got a very similar viewpoint to yours. And I got it from Andy Dia, Diabolis, I think he's called, from the satanic, uh, from the global order of Satan. And this guy, this humanist guy was like, no way. They don't believe anything that we believe. I don't know where you've got your information from. You're totally wrong. And I was being a bit cheeky. Yeah, so yeah, I just yeah. sent him their, their like, the, um, the, pil- the pillars, the pillars of what they believe, which is on their website. And then he just messaged back saying, wow, it's very different to what I thought. And I thought, I think the Satanism thing, to be honest, the guy, you know, the guy I interviewed was a bit of a goth and, uh, or that le- leaning that way. I think they kind of enjoyed dancing around that. Um, There's an that, element of theatre to it. Absolutely. Because otherwise you just, up. you know, because they do little sacrificial kind of rituals as well, which. And the so, cloaks and all of that. So the the, the, the bigger garbs. Thing, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm into all that as well. Why not? But they. <laughs> One interesting thing about it, though, with him, because our conversation, I challenged him a little bit more than I did the, you know, the, 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 the great or... monk or the, the priest I interviewed or the rabbi. or I, 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 I pushed him a little bit more because he was saying there is no God, there is no afterlife, there is no purpose. He was saying very finite, definitive statements. Yes. And then I was like, so why do you want the human race to continue? Okay, And it sounds really nihilistic. And it sounds uncharacteristically, you know, dark and morbid for me because I'm an you know, optimistic guy usually. But if there is no purpose and meaning, I found myself questioning. What is the point? What is the point? Like, although we haven't been, uh, we haven't been detrimental to, to the world throughout our whole existence, 99% of it, we've lived quite peacefully among, you know, in the biosphere. But, but, um, for the past, you know, few hundred years, uh, and the amount of ex- the the amount that our impact has accelerated, I hate to say, but part of me thinks, well, fuck it. Like, if humans go, 
then the, the earth will carry on. The earth will carry on and it will actually be better off without us. And it sounds yeah. really nihilistic. I, the, I'm almost of exactly the same school of thought. So, <laughs> so you don't need to tread too carefully because I don't have kids. And I think if I did, I'd feel very different. Yeah. But because I don't, I do have that same sort of attitude of there's an interesting quote as well from the Jew. Yeah. The rabbi. And he said, are we here to protect she said, earth? She she said, was, she, it was a lady, was it? It, it was a woman. Are we here rabbi. to protect the earth or are we stewards of it? Right. So that's obviously two very different things. Either way, we failed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Human beings are a pretty horrendous plague on the planet. Yeah. And so, maybe we don't deserve to continue living, you know, well, by the grace of whoever on this and of, orb. And of, and of course, we think it's very hard for us to comprehend that because we are humans. Just the same as all dogs wouldn't want dogs to die out. We're species this by our very nature. No, we obviously want humans to continue because we're human. But if you zoom out far enough and you think, you know, the, the, I'm just trying to think of an um, analogy. So say if there was an animal that was really, really destructive and that, like a different kind of animal, animal than humans, that was so destructive, as destructive as humans, part of me would think, well, fuck these guys, get rid of them. Yeah. You know. And I'm sure if <laughs> animals had... Yeah, yeah. consciousness they'd be like they feel that way about us <laughs> you know because we've eradicated so many species in the last few years alone yeah but do you know what the the, the counter argument to this because i've 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 battled... Gi- giraffes aren't fucking up the planet are they no they, they're not <laughs> at all uh, but but the, but it's a shame that like a plague of an idea has has really corrupted us yeah. the idea of um well, more, continuous right? growth more the, the, more the, more this is what the um the uh, Ab- uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murab, the guy I interviewed who, who runs a eco mosque in Cambridge, he said, We've lost the sense of enough is enough. Yes, okay? I remember reading that. Yeah. And I thought he, he was such an interesting guy, such a wise and erudite answer that he gave me. And he said, We've lost that sense of enough is enough. And you think, really, like h- humans haven't had, had such a massive impact for most of our timeline, right? So like literally because nine. we've been living within our means humbly exactly. exactly so it's a shame so it would be a shame for an ideolo- ideology like consumerism like capitalism like would well, like you feel like capitalism growth. is the new religion do you feel like that is the, like the worship of money has yeah su- but it's but there's, you get nothing back from it god or i mean yeah of course you don't it's just a what, fake what sense get? of like, fulfillment like it, it, it's it's it, it's sickening you don't get anything back like you, you hear about these celebrities and rich people who or who, take their own lives. They take their own yeah. lives, or they, 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 they kind of revoke it all, and are like, this hasn't brought me happiness. Well, and Russell it, Brand is a very interesting example of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it's, it goes to show, um, it's so superficial, chasing cap, chasing, like, well, consumer, material a things or money, dream, yeah. or capitalist dream. It's so superficial that, again, our whole timeline has not been that. We've been believed in something bigger than us, something older than, than us for most of human history, you know. And and therefore, it'd be a shame for these past hun- few hundred years to ruin it <laughs> for everybody and us all, di- all, all to die. So Another interesting I, I, point, though, two, two, back two is everybody that you speak to almost has the same things to say, which is that we're in this together. And it's a very interesting time for religion right now because mm-hmm. obviously... You know, science is proving so much and there's a lot of, I guess, anti-religious sentiment around the world. But perhaps religion is the thing that could save the planet. Because if you look at every religion, everything which they say, you know, whether it's the kind of vegetarianism of Hinduism Mm -hmm. or Rastafari or just this idea of like a global community, we're Mm -hmm. all equal, we're all co-inhabitants. Yeah. Everything that almost all of these religions preach is heading towards the saving of the planet. Absolutely. As opposed to just modern day consumerist capitalist society, which is destroying it. Well, this is the reason. I, but the I, problem I, is I the agree. inner squabbling, isn't it? Like with politics, it's like in, with in everything. A, yeah, inner Who's squabbling. Who's the guy who says, he's like, if we could, the, the Islamic um, fellow, is it a, a gentleman in this he case? He was a gentleman, yeah. That he speaks to, says, my hope is that religions can actually combine their resources. Yeah, but you think that they that. can because there's like with politics, there's so much ego, there's so much self interest, and also it's very. I think a big problem lies with uh, in a lot of their books, a lot of their holy books, and a lot of the scriptures that they follow. These problems or this monumental thing wasn't really predicted or planned for. So they're trying to deal with a very modern. 
problem with with uh, with their foot in, you know, in the past, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I agree, man. This is why I did the article, and I'm not pushing any particular religion on anybody, but the... Well, you actually don't express a single opinion in the whole piece, do you? No. You, you just take the quotes that have been lifted from the conversations with each of these figures, present them as exactly that. Here's the quote for Islam. Here's the quote for Judaism. You yeah, go yeah. through the list, showcase, you know, the full range, and yeah. then walk away. Exactly. So you leave it with the reader well, to consume. Uh, and... Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it feels, uh, it felt like a really important thing for me to do, to be honest. I was it The I've Face, been... this piece it was, was in written It The Face for. magazine, yeah. Exciting that that's back. Yeah. Exciting you're writing for them. So yeah, if people <laughs> want to Google that one, The Face, I guess just type in like the link between climate religion. change and religion. And yeah. What does religion up. say about climate change? There we go. But, but the, yeah, spirituality can save us. Perhaps it can because not just like, well, if you if you hone in on on the basic principles of a lot of these um you know the a lot of these religions these ancient religions like you said there's so many similarities and i've realized yeah. this after interviewing three people uh the the um the president of the Hare krishna temple and i spoke to the priest i was like hold on i was like they're kind of saying the same thing and they which was a focus on humility that's Which the key was, word, isn't it? The Harry Krishna guy I wrote down, he said that there's a contamination of the planet because our hearts have been contaminated. Wow. And that goes back to the exact same thing, doesn't it, of the pursuit of material and greed kind of taking over as uh, you know, the, the dominant force and the drive of humanity. Surely we can, we can counteract that ideology, though. It, I think it's so... It, it's kind of... It's kind of... Because a lot of the world is still very spiritual, you know? Yeah. But we, Britain is becoming less spiritual, but surely we can override this like weird obsession with, with self stuff. interest and yeah, stuff. Yeah, and yeah. like, we haven't got this far by being individualistic. It is, it, we, we haven't, it's actually impossible for the human, the human race to have, to have progressed and to be how they are now by being individualistic. We'd never do that. You'd never, you have to work with communities, sharing ideas, building upon that, sharing compassion for each other and growing as a as a united community worldwide community so how all of a sudden it's uh, it's kind of nosedived into a uh, self-interested it does feel like a nosedive as well doesn't it, it? Totally it feels does. like it in, totally the, does. in our I, lifetime basically yeah it's just gone like you basically just chuck the parachute off yeah jumped out the plane and and just like here we go free <laughs> fall <laughs> right exactly man like i i interviewed a, an author called john higgs and he wrote history of the 20th century and he he rewrote the uh, history of the 20th century and he said that basically you can you can kind of track the journey that each century has in in recent history like from where it begins to where it ends you can kind of see the trajectory and the ideas that that kind of uh, unfold and all this but he said the 20th century started with the industrial revolution and ended with the internet and it he Pardon me. He, he describes it as the age of the individual, whereas the past, in the past it was the age ages were kind of defined by hierarchies. So if you were born a peasant or a serf, you, you would you'd kind of live and die as a peasant or a serf, and you're it, destined to that spot yeah, forever. Yeah, exactly. And and it's um and it's it's brutal, but it was kind of stable in a weird way. Is what he argues. Um, but in the 20th century, anyone could be a millionaire. But you know what? That produces so many Anyone losers. Anyone can now also be, you know, in the royal family, can be a president, a prime yeah, minister. Exactly. And, and and this seems, it's like a dangling carrot in front of a donkey. It's like, it seems amazing, but that it produces 99.9% losers in the game, in the game of, of, of this pursuit. Most people lose, okay? And, and if you lose in the age of the individual, it's your fault, just as rags to riches are your, yeah, fantastic. You've done it, self-made man. You've done all this, amazing. You've done it yourself. Great, great, great. What about all those people who haven't made it? It's because you, you know, the weight. You falls didn't have the you. same drive. You, you didn't, didn't have the same, same work. Well, I made it, and I, you know, I was homeless once, and now I'm a millionaire. Fantastic for you, but there's so many people that that doesn't happen to. So, yeah. Therefore, it's this this system, this ideology produces way more losers than it does winners, and kind of us. Our, our constant struggle to pursue, you know, a life of success in inverted commas or, or um, you know, 
consumerist kind of riches and all this kind of thing. This, it benefits people. Us constantly striving for this, it benefits people at the top. And people at the bottom feel kind of, uh, you know, like their losses are their losses because they're not good enough. And that's a shame, I think. That's a shame. Well, I talk about this a lot on the show and my listeners are probably bored of it, but I mean, there's so much with the internet, there's so much comparison yeah, and people yeah. live their lives now by comparison. Whereas, you know, when we were kids, I mean, probably when you were a kid, I'm not that much older, but you know, the internet wasn't around. So there was none of this, like if you were bullied at school, you could at least go home and for the, the evening that you're back home or the weekends or summer holidays, mm -hmm. you're free from bullying. And those moments when you're in school in the playground and you're getting beaten up, then that's hard, but mm. you can escape it because there is escape. Whereas now, I think being a kid must be really fucking rough yeah. because they can just get you all day, all night online. And not only that, but people just sit there looking at their phones rather than living their life and fulfilling their own life with things mm -hmm. that make them happy, not possessions or material things but experiences people you know exercise good yeah. food people just sit there go i wonder what they're up to oh they look like they're having more fun than me and i think that comparison leads to so much dissatisfaction yeah doesn't I, it I, I and it's so hard to just get your head out of that space and go well just put your phone down it doesn't matter what they're up to you focus on you yeah enrich your life how you see fit and yeah yeah i i agree it's, it's very, crazy it's, times it's, isn't it's it? difficult because we we live in through the eyes of other people often we live too much in the eyes of other people you know how do how do I, how am i who am i through their eyes and we're, we're social animals it seems you know we, we you know we benefit a lot from being around people but in the same way i've got nothing against smartphones i think they're good and bad and and you know technology but in the same way loneliness is such a big problem with with older people um because, you know, if you get meals on wheels or whatever, someone comes on your house, they make sure you've got water and food and you've got, you know, a roof over your head. That does not cure loneliness. And, you know, sitting down and talking to someone for five minutes uh, face to face, even phone, phone calls are better than text. Phone calls, yeah, are, phone calls are, are, they're, up, they're up there. They're, they're getting there. But actually sitting with someone and talking or sitting with a group of friends, that can really, um, that does wonders for people's loneliness. And so, like... Therefore, if you're sitting in your sitting in your house, if you're a teenager sitting in your house all the time, you know, looking at your phone, I think it's a shame because I think that's fine, but also there has to be space for hanging out with people face to face. There does because it, you're not actually always connected, although you feel like you are. You're not it's because kind of a, an illusion. I post all the time on the internet, mainly about work stuff, but I post all the time. I'm always mm -hmm. posting stuff, and I think a lot of my friends, I won't see them for ages or talk to them for ages, and they'll be like, "Yeah, but you know, I know what you've been up to because I see on Facebook." And I'm like, "Yeah, but you voyeuristically observing my activity well, is not the same as out. as us, you know, um, developing and nurturing a relationship." Yes. by conversations and face-to-face -face time and yeah effort yeah 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 yeah. effort it, it can contribute to depression and all sorts just it's isolate you feel isolated even though you've got thousands of friends you know what what, what a paradox that's and, always that i got five thousand friends but i can't call one of them yeah 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 <laughs> dude and, have you and, seen the irishman i have not watched it it's it made me terrified about getting old you mentioned loneliness there oh god uh, as a single man i'm all right most of the time but yeah. I'm, you know, I'm still in my uh, clinging on to the last years of my youth. But yeah. I was te after watching that film, just depressed and terrified by the idea of growing old alone mm. and being that guy that's in the home, being washed, no family or friends to visit. It really, really bummed me out. Wow, really dark. It's a, it, <laughs> it's it, a great movie. It's long, but it, it was a very kind of elegaic approach to that classic subject matter that Scorsese's obviously, you know, been entrenched in his whole life. It felt yeah. like the sort of Goodfellas casino, more reflective, introspective, obviously way more mature mm -hmm. version of that kind of storyline. It's a great, if you like his work, I can highly recommend it, but nice. it is long. Yeah, I'll, I'll check it out. The, um, that's why young, to go back to young people, I think that's why young people are have, having sex less than ever. Teenage pregnancies. Are they really? Yeah, yeah. Teenage pregnancies, the lowest it's been well, since the 1950s. Shame. Really? Yeah, yeah. Pregnancy, though, that doesn't necessarily imply that you're not having sex just because you're not getting pregnant. Well, I, either people are finally, on, finally listening in, in sex ed. Right. But no, they're having less sex than ever. And I think it's because, and I spoke to a sociologist, I interviewed a sociologist once about what we drink, why we drink certain types of booze or why we eat certain types of food, you know, why different 
pockets of our society drink the same booze, basically. I thought it was fascinating. Um, and he said you can be social without re- leaving your house, or you can be social, in inverted commas, without leaving your house. So therefore, uh, you don't go to the park to hang out with your mates as you would if you were 15, 16, not drinking, not going to house parties as much maybe. Therefore, you have to be with people to have sex with them. So for teenage pregnancy, it's good that it's gone down, but people are having sex less under 25, under 30 as well. So I think it's... The world's we've got doomed. A we've got a syn- <laughs> yeah, it's like In fact, if anything, men. that's going to be better for the world, isn't it? If less people are knocking out kids, that's going to be better because we keep the population I, down. I don't but know. it is a great shame for the young people out there that aren't copulating and <laughs> well, it's, enjoying... It's, it's, it's symptomatic of, yeah, just, just not being with people. Yeah, and I guess it's a good it's it's a good thing for some reasons, but you know it's uh, I think um, everything's so new. We, we, there's no there's no guinea pigs for this. Well, we are are all the guinea pigs for it, and then the young people are because I grew up without a mobile phone. Until Me I was too. In yeah, my, until I was about sixteen. Dude, I didn't have the internet in my right. life at home where I lived till I was eighteen. Right, right. So <laughs> picture that. That is a full childhood yeah. of freedom. Of yeah. going down the park, getting drunk, you're off the grid, you're up to no good, yeah. you're getting away with murder because your parents don't know <laughs> where you are. It was fucking brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be young now. I genuinely wouldn't. Well, yeah. Do you know what? I think, I think every, every generation has different problems. I, 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 couldn't, so. I, I couldn't agree, really, because I, um, I think jealousy and things like that, they do exist. It's just, it's a bit lawless online. That's the problem. With with porn, it's still new territory. You're it's saying still new territory. Yeah. with with porn or with cyberbullying or yeah, revenge porn or like uh, just fake news. Like it's it's absolutely and bonkers. Hacking but you, and all that kind of stuff. But you know stuff, what? I think yeah. I think the excitement of, of of technology and all that is fading or will fade surely soon. And you know, come everyone's back around, automatically you got phones. Yeah, and no they're like, oh my god, look at my new media. phone. Look at yeah. my new phone. Yeah, yeah. Are you on Instagram? It's amazing. Once that excitement... well, Facebook doesn't seem to be popular at all with young people <laughs> no, anymore, people does it? That, no. Yeah, but once that excitement dies down, maybe people will be going, "Oh shit, maybe you know, maybe this." Let's go outside. Let's go outside. And hang yeah. Out, yeah, I hope so. I, hope I so, mean, because so, everything yeah. does go like that in cycles, doesn't it? Yeah, because we're crazy still time. really excited. You know, what have you seen this new app? What have you seen this new? Like, put pictures. You know, meeting people of the opposite sex or whatever, and whatever people do online, and then I think slowly. When you're used to it, and it's just a normal part of life. You like, you can make a decision: am I online or am I offline? Yeah. Rather than we have to be online because everyone's online. Well, there's the famous phrase, isn't it, when people would use MSN uh, Messenger or Hotmail or whatever it was. Yeah. I never had it because I was, you know, old school. But <laughs> they'd say BRB, be right back, right? Because you wouldn't live your life online. You would go yeah, online go and then you'd go off and live, and then you'd be back online. Whereas now you don't log off, do you? It's just like I'm online right now. My phone's in my pocket right here. All my apps are running. <laughs> I'm like, on airplane mode. I'm there. Oh yeah, what a professional! <laughs> what a pro- well, here's. I mean, we've just jumped straight in on some really intense stuff, and that's, cool. this is why I wanted to get you on because you're a legit journalist. Like okay. you're not like me; you don't just write about music. <laughs> and you know, music journalism, I don't think, is a sort of a noble profession in any sense of the word. Thanks very much. Man. Um, and uh, but, you legit uh, get into subjects, you research, you go out of your way to meet and converse with and engage with fascinating people from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. True journalism. True kind of Louis Theroux. Who's the other dude? John Ronson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like That's that kind of school of thought that I guess you're very much coming from, right? Of trying to understand the the fringe characters, perhaps, and these people that aren't necessarily covered in the mainstream or sometimes accepted Mm -hmm. in the mainstream. Are they the people that you would say you're drawn to the most when it comes to storytelling and documenting? Yeah, so... um, Thank you for the kind words, man. That is You're so, very that welcome. Is so nice. I don't feel like a proper journalist, but um, the uh, I've, I don't, I I wouldn't I I've got little interest to do what you do or what other music journalists do or what a lot of other journalists do, which is interviewing famous people or people who do something specific that you know you're going to interview them about. I've done it. I kind of enjoy it, but it's weird. I think it's because I'm with musicians because I play music myself. I hang out with musicians all the time. There's no mystery there. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Although I do listen and read music journalism from time to time, but I think, I think <laughs> a lot of music, I think a lot of musicians are full of shit basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, f- I like to, f- you know, yeah, maybe more un- like stuff that's a bit uncovered, maybe every day in inverted commas people and the wisdom they have 
or these underground kind of things that are happening because there's so much happening. This is why I love living in, in London. Especially, it's great. It's, for that, it's just the best, yeah. isn't it? For what we do as journalists, as as creatives, as people that want to be out there and meeting people and interviewing yeah. people and experiencing new cultures, it is a, I mean... There's a lot of downsides to London. I think people aren't as friendly as they are in the rest of the yeah, UK. I that agree. is definitely a factor that bums me out. But when it comes to culture and like diversity, it's the one, isn't it? Absolutely. So, so I, I'm I'm committed to compassion. This is where does that come from in, in you? My you life. Were you raised that way? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you've got so much empathy and understanding. Yeah. And do you think it just comes from your parents and literally the way that you were brought up from a young age? It's, what was instilled in you? Yeah, it's both. It, it's it's. It was instilled in me, you know, um, a, a belief in equality and um, a non-judgmental look on the world. Um, and I, I work on it, you know. I exercise my empathy. I exercise it. And um, that's it. Because I mean, it's, it's, like, it's, not an, it's not an easy thing that just comes naturally. Like, you know, positive mental attitude, that is right. something that you also have to work at every day. You know, even, yeah. when, even when you're down and you're sad and life's not easy, you've got to work at it. And you've got to make an effort to be that way. Because it's, yeah, I agree. And it's, it's easy to feel compassionate to people that look like you or are like you. It's very easy, actually. Um, because. Well, it doesn't require well, it, any it, effort it, it, it on comes your part. Easy, it comes easier to me, for, for example. But it came easy to me in the past. But, you know, I, I, I'm constantly exercising my empathy, hanging out with people that are very different to me, experiencing sorry having them explain their experiences to me so therefore i understand it more and, and not just I'm, writing I'm big, them off i'm a big believer of freedom of belief as well freedom of belief i'm a massive i'm a massive liberal basically well, you're like that, me you're a true liberal in the sense that you don't really care what someone thinks no. or says as long as they can back it up and you can talk to them about it yes i agree yeah yeah I, i'm just I'm, I'm as liberal as it gets i believe people should believe can believe you whatever be you. they want but i think that um Unless you're and that, that guy from Don't Fuck With Cats. Into. So <laughs> sometimes I'm, I'm just thinking like, sometimes I think like, how is no one, like, I guess it's training my brain to see stories everywhere. And it, it, it kind of came from in, from, in journalism, it came from my, was it university? Did you London. study journalism at uni? Yeah, I studied yeah. journalism at uni. And our teacher once um, said, leave this classroom and go and find me a story and don't come back until you've got one. Wow. And it what was a great that, teacher. What a radical teacher. Yeah, right. It was radical. And it was the first year. It, it was like one of the first lessons of this investigative course um, uh, module. And so I went out in the street and I was like, what the fuck am I going to do? And mm-hmm. I was like, as everybody in the class did. Yeah, yeah. No doubt. Yeah. We all just went in different directions yeah. by ourselves. And I was just like, scratching your head like <laughs> shit. <laughs> and, um, but that goes back to what we were saying earlier about even if you come back with something that's a failed attempt, it's the joy is in the trying and the attempt. Yeah. And a lot and it's teaching you to think that way. Yeah, totally, totally. And although the story, it was pretty whack. It was just like, mm-hmm. uh, well, of course they are. It's like when you're at film was. school, like I, and you're like, here's a camera, go make a film. So you just go to like the cafeteria and filming, make play pool. Yeah. And then there's five films that also do that. And you're like, oh yeah, of course. Let's think yeah. outside the box a bit then. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it doesn't matter what you've produced. This is, this is the one, another thing I do when I work with young people, I try to instill in, in, in you know, um, gently is, a. Uh, it doesn't matter what you produce sometimes, you know. I don't do music or lyric writing workshops with young people or art workshops. I don't do those to make, turn them into musicians or artists or actors. I do them just to be like, you've done this today in two hours. You know, you, you've made it, you've written some lyrics, you've written some poetry or you've, you've, uh, you've made a piece of art, a mood board collage or made some kind of mask or something. You've done that, and like, sure, you might not ever want to look at it again. You might think it's stupid, but you've done it. It's the act, it's the act of doing it. So, exact, exactly with the story, like with you with your film, uh, film studies, you've done it, and you're like, okay, that wasn't brilliant, but I did make it. I I made that. I've done a bit of magic with my my fingers. You know, I've made it. And what if I spent all day doing that? What if I spent all week doing it? What if I dedicated my life to doing it? Surely, you know, it's it's that's a stepping stone to for a lot of people. So. So, yeah, so it's a combination of me, you know, just caring about everybody, you know, committed to compassion and also seeing stories everywhere. That's, that's the combination. How do you exist as a creative? Uh, I struggle. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that if you're well off, then you can spend all day cultivating your writing style yeah. or your painting technique. You know, I think that the the arts now more than ever are dominated by middle to upper class people, mm-hmm. because especially in rock and roll bands, you're not really seeing any working class bands right, yeah. coming up and being successful anymore because it's hard. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, I guess. Did the journalism, Survival. the journalism, and everything come before the band, or were they always kind of both there, forefront, hand in so, hand? So I've always played in bands since I was about thirteen years okay. old. I used to play uh, just in my hometown, in my mates' garages. Like classic story, you know, as old as time. Playing in my mates' living room at the youth club, all all over the place. And then I played in a ska reggae kind of band. My man, it was fantastic. <laughs> I loved it so much. Then I played in a hardcore band. Yeah, uh, in college. And then I had a little bit of a break and I went to university. London was, you know, throwing everything at me. I, I Did you study off. down here? So I studied down here, yeah. Right. And then um, and then I had a break from being in bands. I, like I said, I was always in one from about 14 to about nine, uh, 18. Uh, every year, different bands. And then... And then I did, journal, I did journalism at university. A lot of my course... A lot of my course mates didn't stick it out. They Sorry, afterwards, a lot of them sat, you know, worked in different areas... Because I think university can really put you off something as well as as well as well ignite a flame inside of you. It can really put you off it. You're like, three years is enough. I don't want to do anything like that again. Uh, you know, you might the subject might be not what you thought it was. But for me, I was really keen. So the the, the journalism and music have been always been hand in hand, really. Um, but recently, I'm working only as a journalist. And When you came out of moment. uni, how were you getting by? How were you paying your bills fresh out of uni? Were you working in bars? Or, yeah, I worked yeah. in bars, yeah. yeah. I, w- I worked in bars and music venues. Same and, as me. And then... Uh, so when I met you, when you did that show at the... God, that venue's changed so many times. I can't remember what You know the one I mean? Called, Down yeah, by the video shop in Camden. That's gone as well. So when you played there, I think Milk Teeth maybe played it as well. Yeah, they did, yeah. Um, what were you doing at that point? About four, Where were you working ago. full-time? Because the band had pretty much just... Waco had just started. Yeah, right? yeah Waco just started. I was thinking I was working at 12 Bar. Okay. In, in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. Soho. Yeah. Uh, also uh, gone. <laughs> also gone. For fuck's yeah. sake. <laughs> Everything changes. Um, so I was working at Twelve Bar, yeah, yeah, iconic venue in 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 central London. So surrounded by music all the time and watching bands all day. It's good, good, good inspiration, you know. Especially even if they're not your cup of tea, you're like, okay, cool. I don't really want to do that on stage. Yeah, or but... I can do that, but better. Or <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. And yeah, also, I'm you're. Sensitive, but you know, like even if you watch it, you go, ah, that wasn't really. I didn't really enjoy that that much. But then you think. I can fucking do this better. A large part of me really does miss bartending and working really? working in bars and the hospitality industry because some of my best friends in my life that I've made have been through yeah. those avenues and you know areas and a lot of the women that I've met in my life have been through there right. and just the experiences but I guess I don't know it's kind of a young man's game I feel like Okay. Obviously, there's lifers who are in it for forever yeah, yeah. And, and fair play, but a large part of me does miss the the camaraderie yeah. of it because, you know, everything I do is kind of quite solitary, DJing, interviewing, mm-hmm. writing. It's all fairly, you know, there's obviously collaboration to an extent, but it's mainly but it's me. A team, yeah, it's, it's a solitary a existence, whereas when you're tending by, you're all sort of in it together, aren't you? It's a very, mm-hmm. it's a very fun profession to be in to a point. I think, and I had nothing but a great time doing it. And I attended yeah, bars man. for about eight or nine years. You just so, have to, you, you have to, you have to just not be precious about what you do. You know, we we, we all have to make money. So we all have to make money. We have to, unless mm-hmm. you're born into money. We have to work things, and unless you unless you do what you love for a living and somehow make a lot of money from it, we all have to do things perhaps throughout our life that, that perhaps we that isn't exactly what we want to be doing, but it's not about that. It's sometimes what you do outside of your work is what it defines you. That, that That's what defines you. Sometimes I mean 100%. your work defines you. It, it, different types of, different types of um, worldviews, you know, like my job is me. This is who I am. This is what I do. And this is me. Sometimes you're like, I've got friends who are electricians. I've got one friend who's an electrician and I've got, he never talks about it in the pub. We don't sit and talk about, you know, circuit boards and shit like that. I don't talk uh, but we to talk any about, of we talk my about friends music, talk about, about football, what talk about any all of us do for work. Things. It's all about, you know, as you say, yeah, things football, you like. Music, exactly. Not what do you do, 
like whenever you're at weddings i've been to so many weddings in my time and because i'm the single guy you're always put on the table with other single people and you know the fucking losers (laughs) and you're there (laughs) and they're like so what do you do and i'm like don't ask me that ask me what do i like what do you like Like, what defines you like yeah then i just want to say i'm a lollipop man (laughs) there's the end of the conversation yeah i said i was you're gonna i just cross the road all day i used to say i was a uh, male escort there you go male prostitute I'm sure you could run with that all evening a, a man of your acting thought, talents I just, <laughs> I just start thought, um, inventing all kinds of backstories I just didn't I just didn't like I, I, I it's remember the mingling worst. in some circles a few years ago that were like oh hi so what do you do oh hi what do you mm-hmm. do and I was like so who do you like, work for it was like yeah. fucking top trumps of like what, what, what people what people work for or who they are or you know it's a status thing there's a lot of that in london as well unfortunately and yeah. i just said i'm a male prostitute amazing people, people were just like okay <laughs> <laughs> and we just walk off into the into yeah, the night there's no like, there's no question oh, cool. B. so <laughs> do you like it uh it's like i've got nothing against blows sex, their mind. You know, sex workers uh, i think you know i've got nothing against them but i just thought what can i say that will upset this yes uh fucking circle jerk yeah exactly <laughs> loving your work so when do you start writing professionally Straight um, out the gate, you're lucky enough. No, no, so you were out there hustling and no, chasing. No, no, I was writing for free for a long time. Right, so I was writing for music magazines, writing for websites for free. I don't know if you've done this before. I it, worked for Kerrang Radio for ten months, full time, ten um, unpaid, for free. Yeah, every day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Got to do like, it, man. If if you're not prepared to do that, go work in another industry. It's shit. Like it's shit. you have to do that. But I, I've encountered a few people in recent years that are you know young people starting out, and they're like, oh, you know, all I get paid is my my train fare and i'm like well i never even got that and i did it for mm. 10 months so if you want it you do it if you don't go get a job that's going to yeah. pay you well you, you, simple you, as that it's definitely it's definitely uh hard work so I, I did a couple of internships which were unpaid and i worked at a bar at the weekend and then um i also was writing for free but it was quite fun though it was quite a good exchange exchange i understand everything has its place in this world the place of these free gigs that i i got to go to gigs all the time i got to interview rockers that I liked and musicians and uh, get films before they came out, you know, like review the film or review the album. And I, I did enjoy that because it, it, it helped me hone my craft. And uh, and you're a man of the arts. So these are all the things that you exactly. I was like, enjoy being albums around before they come out. I'm going to these wicked gigs. I've got like press passes and you didn't get paid, but it was good fun. And then I got paid once by the Beat magazine, uh, which is like a newspaper kind of thing. And then I was like, you know what? I've been doing this for a couple of years now. And I, I did, and then Vice offered me, and then I did an internship with Vice, which was unpaid again. That's changed now. I think you can't work for, I think you have to get paid if, if you do internships now. But anyway, and then afterwards, they offered me a freelance contract at vice.com. And I was like, fuck yeah. And then they, they started paying me. And my pay is actually, and, th- and then now I don't write for free. I write for free for myself. To, you know practice or just for to exercise my creativity but now i feel confident enough to ask for fees for people i don't think it's i don't think it's uh unreasonable <laughs> pay me man i, don't I know right you so, get, so you're getting the art but, and the but service I definitely, work, I definitely it was definitely a hard graft it is but and, if and you it love it then it doesn't be, feel that way continues that's the thing to be, right? yeah cause i end up in like you know buddhist temples i end up all over the place at gigs at, uh, in, in really unusual situations i never otherwise would be if I wasn't writing about it. That's you driving that though. That's not that's like true, a gig yeah. that sent you there, is it? No, it's, it's always, always off your own back and accord and your idea. Yeah. Oh, let's go and chase and investigate this. I love that about you. Thank you. I love it. <laughs> I want to ask you this. So if you spend months researching a story yeah. and you're just getting paid by the word, yeah. like how do you make so that, up that discrepancy so, in your head? Do you just have to know that you're just going to build a portfolio and you're going to hone your craft and develop well, your you skills know, and get good life experience yeah well yeah there's part part of it is that that's why music journalism's easy is you just phone up some fucking dude and go oh tell me about your 10 favorite albums type it up hand it in yeah. bosh done you it's, do that it, in an it, afternoon it's it's interesting it's interesting which is why I it's never not talk, an honorable craft i never talk about my journalism like, that's so nice to be asked man um was well, because you're legit that's what i said yeah god these I, stories i've been reading today i'm like wow this dude has gone out of his way to really immerse himself in these worlds that's the true nature of journalism. I'm reading at the moment, um, The Joke is Over, which is Ralph Steadman's memoirs of okay. his years working with Hunter S. Thompson. And so I'm very much in Gonzo world as we speak. Yeah, now. yeah. 
And so I'm very much if kind you... of myself thinking, well, what can I do? Because he was my favourite writer. I studied English literature yeah. with film at uni. I just wanted to be Hunter S. Thompson, the drugs, the drinking, the hell raising uh-huh. and all, but the, the art, the craft first and foremost. And I've sort of taken Gonzo as an approach into podcasting. Like I like to think of my podcast as a Gonzo podcast. I don't edit, blah, blah, blah. But um, it's still very much media centered the conversations yeah. that i'm having which is what i'm trying to branch out of but but when you go and tour with bands yes uh, uh, if so so the gonzo style i guess does exist in music journalism if you go and tour with bands you know write about write about the tour experience yeah but i mean there's not that many bands nowadays that are exciting enough to do you know what, provide you <laughs> so with we the fodder. checked into a because uh, they're all sober yeah. like Ramada uh, in then we yeah, checked right. yeah we got a greg's and then yeah. we <laughs> <laughs> it's not that famous but then but then uh the Polish, then, then the Polish can... punk scene in London culture, oh, yeah. for example. You've done this great article. Is that for Vice? Who's that one for? That was for Noisy. That's, on Vice, that's for yeah. Noisy. And that is, I guess, you were at this show. Did you even know it was a Polish no, gig? I, I wandered in because there was a, there used to be a venue up in Tottenham called T Chances, which was a community center where all, a community center where all the money went to charity, a war charity. All of it. Uh, well, well, apart think, from like think, paying I, electricity or yeah, whatever. I think, yeah, I I think made, apart all from profit. That, it's set up. It's, it was set up as a charity organisation, anyway. But they used to have death metal gigs, children's birthdays, Irish folk nights, absolutely anything. Because it was a community space. I played a gig there once. I went to put my bass, went to put my guitar in the um, in the backstage area. The he says room. in inverted commas. <laughs> in inverted commas. <laughs> and there was a chicken coop in there. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. And I was like, "What's going on here?" They're like, oh, yeah, we have chickens there. We, we, you know, we sell eggs to the local community. So it was one of those kind of places. And I stumbled in one time. I say stumbled in. I wasn't. I probably did actually. I, you know, I do like a beer. <laughs> I stumbled in. I stumbled upon it. I mean, yeah. and I was like, "This is great," but I don't recognise any of the lyric. I can't pick out any of the lyrics. I soon realised everyone was singing along but me, and I, I thought, "This is weird." And everyone Am was I Polish. dreaming? Yeah, everyone yeah. was Polish, and they're and selling the Tisky bands... and JVH beers behind That's the counters. Right, yeah. yeah, and everyone was Polish, and all the bands were Polish, and they were singing in Polish. And I was like, oh, cool. So it must be a, um, it must be some, uh, you know, visiting Polish band. No, turns out, no. Turns out All Polish just expats Londoners. have been there for, you know, such a long time that uh, n- Polish bands have emerged in London and in, in Birmingham and Nottingham and all over the place. And they put on gigs. It's not solely for Polish bands, but sometimes lineups, well, that one I went to was all Polish bands. I thought it was pretty cool. So I got to know some bands. I went to one of their band practices uh these fucking was massive was called moscow moscow yeah, yeah these massive polish blokes with skinheads and tattoos on their well, faces I, I spent a month in poland about 10 years ago <laughs> and the dudes are fucking big they're big they're guys built like brick shit houses. i was just sitting there with my notepad in his in his uh <laughs> thing like all right guys yeah, don't worry i'm not gonna you know take the piss and so it was good to get to know all these and i interviewed a classic uh polish punk band called deserter um so what were they like 80s era they were 80s because because the reason Polish punk is... I'll give a bit of background for the Please people do. listening. The reason Polish punk is interesting, I thought, is because it wasn't like the late 70s like it was in the UK and, and the US. It kind of started or kind of took off in 82 onwards, throughout the 80s. And it soundtracked a lot of young people getting involved in politics or becoming politically minded. So the bands were singing about... you know They were part of the Soviet Union at the time. A lot of the bands were singing about real, like, real, real struggles. Whereas in the UK, it was a bit like, I'm you know, a, a, bit, a bit fashion-y in the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in, 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 in the 80s in Poland, it was pretty serious. The government controls about. what we can and can't get access to, yeah. and where we can go. And, well, our yeah. lyrics and that kind of thing. Yeah, and yeah. and they, distrib- they couldn't have record shops with punk records, so they distributed them at gigs and all this. And then it actually soundtracked... It's a proper DIY underground proper, proper punk DIY. culture, yeah. And then it soundtracked the... The falling of the Soviet Union, the, the collapse, and and by 1989, 1990, punk was really big in Poland. And you think all these young people who are going to punk gigs, and there was like there was like um, a movement called a group, an organization called Sol- Solidarity. Uh, yeah, Angel- Angelic Upstarts have got a song about them, about this Polish group, and they they were, you know, really anti-establishment and really wanted to change things, and they did. And uh, there was links between those and these punk bands that you think. God, this is really potent—a really, really real thing for them. And it, sure, it was a little bit later than the UK and Europe, UK and US. But 
how much more meaningful does that feel? You know, like we're going to have to fucking galvanize. We're going to have to get on the streets and, and, and really change things. So that was fascinating, that Polish punk piece. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And I went to, you know, a few gigs and I went to- Have you been to practices. Poland? I, yeah, I have actually, yeah. when I was a kid. It's a great place. Great it was place. boiling hot when I was there. Was it? I do. I, I went in December ages. time, so it's freezing, snow so, everywhere. Oh, really? Yeah, beautiful country they've that, though. They've got both, but when I was there, people don't realise in the summer it's so hot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's boiling. Um, and as well, I guess, like we were talking about with Satanism earlier, there's a lot of misconception with European punk scenes like that because mm. people, I guess, would just assume, oh, far right, Nazi skinhead, okay. foot hooligan. Yeah. And that element is obviously theirs, and fortunately is with all, but it's not a key part of what the main underground scene is about. If anything, they stand in direct opposition yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I know Europe has got some uh, issues with far-right uprisings, but it's not something I encountered in the Polish punk scene I was investigating. They were really... Uh, yeah, really... When, did you, when did you do the piece? A couple of years ago now, yeah. was it? Is it still like a thing? Is it still happening? It's no, still there's kicking a few off? bands that are still knocking around. Low Rollers, Pro Publico, Got to take, what, take one of them on tour with you, mate. War. Yeah, man. That'd be amazing. Some of them are bigger than us. They're, are they? they? They just... Who asked them for a support slot then. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> So, no, that was a cool piece, man. Thanks for reading it. Um, I want to ask as well about... This one was fascinating. The um, <laughs> the the online possessed doll trading. Right, okay. I actually spoke about this on NPR radio once. I went did to you? the BBC Studios and got interviewed about it because I did a big investigative piece because... Basically, this is another vice piece. This is another yep. vice piece, and it was about haunted dolls. It's it's about the buying and selling and adopting of haunted dolls online. Okay, so these are just regular kind of dolls that look pretty freaky. Classic. I've seen like, some of the pictures in the article. Yeah, you wouldn't want to sort of turn on a bedroom light yeah. in a strange house and just see that there and <laughs> be left alone with the thing. It, it, so I, I saw an advert on eBay, you know, in the other section of eBay, other miscellaneous. I can't say I've ever delved that far <laughs> down, mate. Right, it's, this, it's, is, this is. Uh, do you do a lot of that as a, as you say, like somebody who's constantly looking for inspiration and stories? Right. Do you spend a lot of time in internet wormholes late oh, at yeah, night? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like Reddit, especially. Um, but so, so you yeah, find the other section. You find the other section, there. and then there's miscellaneous on eBay. There's people selling dates with themselves. People selling like anything sex really toys. creepy. And so well, I guess this is pretty creepy. But anything super seedy or dark? Uh, I'm sure there is. I can't really remember if there was anything what anything specific. But anyway, there was a doll for sale. Like possessed doll. Do not buy. Like. <laughs> All this do shit. Not buy, but actually, please do. <laughs> and it sold for like one thousand two hundred dollars. Wow. And I was thinking that is just like a gonk that you'd find in like finding the charity shop with like one eye missing and like crazy hair. And I thought, who's buying that? That seems bonkers. If you believe it's haunted, why would you buy it? If you if you don't believe it's haunted, haunted, why would you pay a thousand quid for it? That sounds that seems cr- crackers to me. So, so then, you obviously want this possessed demonic yeah, doll you in Unless your you house. Make, Why? Maybe you're dealing with the dark arts or something. So I started doing a bit of research and I found these whole forums online, these these dense, busy forums of people buying and selling and adopting. This is the weird bit, adopting haunted dolls. So they had these like makeshift adoption papers that you could get to adopt them it's got this it's got the spirit of a of a little boy from the victorian times or it's got the spirit of an old woman who used to live in the area and all this kind of creepy stuff and i spoke to loads of buyers and sellers and people who collect collect them and it was fascinating they they told me horror stories one of them had two young kids this woman had two young kids and she told me about she bought a doll to kind of exercise and things went wrong it was like moving things around in the house and talking to the kids and then she had to get rid of it and i was like why would you invite it why would you invite that when you've got your... kids when you've got little yeah, kids that's irresponsible isn't it? um but it, it it was just crazy Even if you don't believe I, i'm not going to take that chance if I yeah did. yeah and it, it was fascinating because it was like um i spoke to a parapsychologist who studies ghosts and what's his name i can't remember what was wasn't his name. it john six cents john six cents <laughs> What else could it Cannot be? Cannot be his real name, surely. <laughs> but then again, with a name like that, what else are you going to do with your life? <laughs> John so Sixth John Sixth Sense told me, he goes, some people adopt them because, it's just sad, it gets quite deep, adopt them because they can't, can't have, have children. Yeah. yeah. Or, or because they've lost a child or something. It's really tragic stuff. But he said, that's not a good thing to do if you've lost a child. It's not, it's not 
healthy. Well, it's never going to replace say. that kid that you've lost, is it? Or it's no. never going to, you know, give you the kid that you can't have. It's just going to. It's like a, it's like a, the, the spirit of a of a boy from the Victorian times trapped in the body of an action man. Or something. Where did you stand personally on the the subject going in to write the piece? <sighs> so, did you believe in any way, shape, or form in I the think, the reality of this? I think idea of possession and so I think it. I think energy there is and such spirits. thing as yeah. I think there's such thing as spirits and ghosts, and and energies. Um, you felt that before starting felt, to speak to these people and yeah, I feel developing that. the piece. I feel that, and I think it's it's a superstition. But I think it's, I think a lot of us are superstitious, and and even atheists and and and, and people who are very skeptical. Because, for example, if there'd been a like. You know, it's a very crude example, but if there'd been a massacre in this house that we're sitting in now, your flat, there'd been a massacre and someone had killed a few people, killed his family or something horrible like that, you know, God forbid, would you feel comfortable moving in immediately afterwards? Well, it's a kind of similar stem uh, and thread is I played the Bataclan venue in Paris. Right, okay. uh, In February last year with Steel Panther. And I walked in the room and... I've never had any paranormal experiences. I would, I'm not what you would call a believer in, you know, sp- spirits and yeah. things like that. But when I was in that room, I felt not a dark energy, but I felt like there was a very powerful energy in there. Mm. Like so, you could just feel something intense and, yeah. and playing. And obviously, I know those guys in that band, and so I had a, a kind of loose connection. And when I read that news, it was, I mean, everybody who's in the music community was affected by that. But to play that room and to take, especially such a fun band as Steel Panther, Mm -hmm. into that room and and put put on this show of just joy and laughter and and to feel the energy in the room and the crowd kind of, you know, to see there. It was a very overwhelming experience for me. And a big part of it, I think, was that that ground and that building and that place and what had happened happened there there, and the remnants of that. Yeah, I can imagine, man. So, so yeah, I feel the same way. Like, so I went into it thinking, you know, yeah, I think there is something we do leave some kind of energy when we pass because we we see time as linear. You know, time isn't linear. T- t- time does what time wants. Time's fucking bonkers, you know. So what? What if if I died in this room tomorrow? So this still could be something lingering of me here. You know, if, even if they, even if they took my body out. Um, but I did have a. I did was skeptical that you could package. Yes. A spirit in a box and yeah, send it yeah, yeah. to the other side of the country or the other <laughs> yeah, side of the world. I thought, yeah. come on, like well, you you spoke to this guy and he said, didn't he? That often it's about it's about the house and the sun, yeah, so not spe- actual objects themselves. Exactly. So he said that when there's a haunting, it's usually associated with a, with a person, a human, a living person, or a house lo- or a location, rather than an object. Um, and he said you can't really, you know. He believed that the parapsychologist. Um, he believed that you couldn't. You couldn't package them and send them away. The spirit would do what the spirit wants. You know, the, the spirit's not. Like, oh, I'm <laughs> trapped. Like, okay, anyway, oh, help me out. <laughs> yeah. you know, like get a me fucking out of Toy here. Story doll. <laughs> the Woody's off. Yeah. Um, so, but then I did go and meet one of the head honcho, uh, Jane Harris, she's called, one of the head honcho haunted doll dealers, I guess you'd call it. Right. And she and she doing this as a full time career, like well, I saw her on the income. TV the other day, so she's doing really well for herself. <laughs> on like he's talking about paranormal stuff. Yeah, so. yeah. But when I met her, she was just um, just existed solely on these forums. I went to meet her in a hotel in Worcester, not too far from where you're from, right? Yeah, Worcester. And um, I went to meet her in a hotel, and I was getting a bit nervous in a hotel room, in a hotel in the like, lobby, little lobby kind of area. Right. And she'd bought loads of dolls with her to show me, oh, to brilliant. introduce me to them. And I was right. like, oh, shit. And it was so weird, like, being with them. I was like, although I do not believe that it's haunted, I would not have that in my bedroom. And it was so weird. It was like, I was battling between, like, do I believe this? Is this bonkers? Or is this... How was she as a, an individual? She was totally... Was she fairly on the level and kind of, you know, approachable, sociable, mm. quote, unquote, normal? Yes, yeah, she was. And that that was the weirdest thing about it is how normal she was. But she said that she believes she wouldn't. My biggest question, which I ask a lot of people on the fringes who have beliefs that are different to my own, I always ask whether they're paranormal or otherwise. Otherwise, I I always try to gently say, do you understand why people might not believe what you believe? Yeah. Without saying you're crazy. These these of things course, I think yeah. are very dis- dismissive. 
um, you know, dismissive Back thing to, to that say. empathy thing. Empathy. So do you understand why people might not believe what you believe? And, and she, why is it that you do? Yeah, and why is yeah. it that you do? She was like, absolutely. She goes, I thought this was all crazy before I had experience. So it was all based on experiences. And a lot of what I believe is based on my experience in life. So well, that is therefore, true. That's true of all of us, right? Yeah, exactly. So that therefore, how can I how can I deny worldview? I can, how can I deny the legitimacy of what she believes? Her truth she's is her truth. She literally had an experience wherein she thought a doll or her house was haunted or whatever it was. Um, who am I to judge? What about you? What do you think? Um, so you said so you, that was the Bata Clan situation was that the first time the back, I mean there's there's for me there is something about because I've been very pli- uh, blah, 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 if I can speak blah, 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 uh, privileged to yeah. have done many many tours and for me there is always an energy in the room after the crowd's gone home yeah and because yeah. I'm often packing down at the end I will I'll try and wait until almost the crew and the bar staff and everyone is out of the venue mm-hmm. and I, especially when you're doing a big venue like a Brixton Academy or something I like to be the last person you know there's the after party will be going on at the bar upstairs and I like to be the last person in the room that night because for me even though everybody's gone you can still feel the remnants of the energy that was in that room whilst the gig was happening yeah and I've always felt it in the live environment I've always felt that the back clan was the most potent and powerful example of that because of all those lives that were obviously tragically lost mm. in such horrendous circumstances and to then come back and feel the joy that was powerful but i've never had anything in say a building that isn't related to an entertainment or event or do you know what i mean yeah um i'm open to it i'm open to anything and i yeah, I, me too. I would like <laughs> to believe that there's multiple universes and creatures and all kinds of other amazing stuff out there because yeah. it would be a shame if this was all there was and i believe in something after death at least i would like to believe in that it's quite arrogant to think that th- what we perceive is exactly how everything is of course it is it's of like course a, it is. A, it's, it, again it's very and where i mean every religion is really. kind like, of the same isn't it so all of these ideas have to come from something which is like well who well, who who made the big bang then if the big bang started it well who who caused that yeah, like yeah. everything has to have a root and a start that's yeah. the ultimate and trip, think, isn't it? Is what was the what was the initial seed of all of this? The first ever fucking blows my mind. I, can't, I haven't got an answer. <laughs> I would be amazed if you did. I'd be yeah. like, what are you doing sitting here what, talking what is, to me? How did someone tell me recently <laughs> they compared the Big Bang to something? They were saying, um, oh, it, it was someone trans, transposed. Uh, it was my friend Gavriel. He said transposed the, transposed the idea of the Big Bang, compared it to like a creation story. Mm-hmm. And how there's so much similarity between the two. Yeah. In that everything that we know came from one thing. Yeah. Came from one thing. Yeah. It was all created from this one thing. We don't know what came before. We don't know why, but it happened. Have you seen Noah? So am, I, am I talking about the Big Bang, bag, big bang or am I talking about God creating everything? It, it's, a, it's the same story Yeah, in a really weird way. Anyway, he did it better than me, but that, that was his... That was his uh, point of view have you seen the movie noah no dude you got to watch it i always get the piss taken out of me because i think it's the best film ever made it's my I've favorite film ever it. oh it's uh, fairly it's, recent it's darren aronofsky it was like 2014 right darren aronofsky and it's obviously about the story of noah's ark um but everything in that film you know from spirituality to vegetarianism to family like it's just for me it hits home on every level the meaning of life and it's done wow. in such a radical way because he's obviously you know the fucking guy that made requiem for a dream and pie mm-hmm. and these gnarly movies so it has that style of his but and also you know let's be honest noah's ark is the just in terms of story that is the greatest story ever told you tell me a greater story right. than a fucking dude that makes an ark and puts two of every creature in it and sails off into the fucking new world because the rest of the world has been eradicated yeah, yeah. <laughs> by a vengeful God. It doesn't get more, much more epic than that. Yeah. And then to situate that epic story in a family drama and it has greed and the evil of man and how it's all about trying to just, you know, what we were talking about earlier, I need more, enough isn't enough. It's an amazing movie on every level. I fucking love it, but loads of people are like, oh, it's rubbish. It's not the best film ever. I'm like, well, what is? But the reason I love yeah. that film is because they refer a lot to God as the creator right, in okay. that. So it's not about religion. It's about the environment, really, yeah. and life. And they call him the creator throughout. It's like the creator did this, the creator did that. 
and so there isn't really any kind of religion or dogma in that sense it's more about existence yeah yeah whatever was whatever created everything yeah whether it was a big bang or whether it was uh an omnipotent god you've got to watch the movie i'm up for it i'm well up for it yeah Let's talk about your podcast, which you're going to be starting. I want to end on the band, um, and we'll talk yeah, about yeah, that last. Band, uh, Human Magic is the name of the new record by Waco. It's also going to be the name of a podcast you're going to be launching, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you said you've <laughs> recorded one episode. Tell me all about the idea for it, first of all. Okay. Is it going to be you as a solo host interviewing a yeah. random selection of well, a little, a little wonderful bit, people? A little bit of both. So it'll be me doing what you do, so yep. in, interviewing people one-on-one, um, and... And also being out in the streets with my uh, with my recorder. So you're going gonzo. I'm going to go out there, yeah. I love it. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to speak to different people from different walks of life about the big subject. So I've got, um, let me just see. I, I wrote down a tagline. Basically. Mate, you don't need to be looking at your notes. This is, you think? sell me the pitch, dude. You know it. It's in your heart. Okay, so. <laughs> It's Let's me, go with me, the title me, first of all. What human does that represent magic. to you? Human magic, you know, it, it, magic exists all around us. Community, love, forgiveness, creation, life, life death. is so much. Life, death, it's all magic in certain ways. I think it's all, it's all magical, uh, and and the podcast is me trying to ha- learn how to navigate this weird and wonderful world. I do think it's it's good. I think it, I think the world's good. Despite what I said earlier about wanting all humans to die out. Well, no, I love that about you. You know, you're obviously a very optimistic, <clears throat> positive, hopeful human being. Yes. And you give off that energy when you're playing on stage, <laughs> when you're just walking around the world in life. Like, that is you. Thank you, man. Yeah, I, I, it's an effort, you know. I, I do try. It comes naturally, but I, I, I cultivate it as well. So it's me trying to navigate this weird and wonderful world with the help of other people that live here, you know, through their experiences and their beliefs. So it's me orienteering, really. It's an orienteering podcast. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but through belief and through experience. Sometimes people that are very similar to me, but sometimes people that are very different to me because I think inspiration lies absolutely everywhere with, with people who you can really associate with. Oh, yeah, they're really like me. I can really, you know, I can really um, relate to what they're saying. But also where you're like, I cannot relate to that, you know, specific experience. But I think there's still something to be, gathered from it so i won't be interviewing famous people really i'll i'll be interviewing unless they're super out there and interesting and yeah i'll be, I'll be interviewing more um perhaps people you don't know not you but perhaps people that are lesser hey mate, i'll, lesser I'll known. come on if you want to speak to me I'd yeah. love to. <laughs> i don't know how interesting i'll be as a guest but uh, but, but but the lesser known you know lesser yeah, known yeah, people yeah. so so the topics we're going to cover in the first few because i've got them planned i've got them arranged uh is it going to be going to be weekly bi- bi-weekly or you're not I haven't quite, decided yet. You're just going to get as much sort of, yeah. I hate the word, but content in the can. Going to get content in the can. And then launch when you feel like you've got enough to run for a while comfortably. And then and you can yeah. be my mentor. I'm happy to help, mate. So on we're gonna, hand. We're going to journey through Satanism, through uh, tra- transgender rights and experience. We're going to travel through addiction, through depression, uh, through Islam, through climate change, Christianity. So um, a little bit like. Youth work. Um, permit just, the comparison a little bit like Russell Brand's Under the Skin yes yeah a little bit like that but perhaps less through intellectual through your filter yeah, yeah through my yeah yeah, yeah. My filter, I don't think I'm going to speak to um, professors it, and... he, speak, he speaks to amazing people and I really love that podcast but um, I do think yours would be more I, about I, the I common can, people I can offer something that is a little bit more perhaps more accessible maybe. yes yeah 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 because because even that is is quite heavy to listen to mm-hmm. um and quite dense in its academia and its so vocabulary so, no doubt as well knowing him. yeah yeah so <laughs> so but similar, so a little bit like that but a bit but a bit, bit, yeah. bit more um and perhaps informal and informal yeah nice man so yeah man it's 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 a, it's a leap of faith but fuck it you know I interview so many. What it came, what the idea came from, is I interview so many people, and, and you've got all these interviews that you turn into an article. Yeah. But then it's like, and sometimes we only use a paragraph of what we said, and we talk for an hour. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, one dude, I'm sure you have hours and hours worth of stuff with is the the alien guy. Yes. Yeah, that's actually available as a podcast. I'll re- is it? re-release it actually. Yeah. Well, you should make that the first episode of Human Magic, maybe. Yes, I think so. That, yeah, because that, that's a fascinating area. We can maybe brush on the. Very, very the surface brief, of that one quickly. Very briefly, I interviewed a gentleman who used to be um, 
kind of a voice on UFOs and ufology through the 90s because he studied it and he was a bit of a cosmic guy um, and kind of had the background in science and astrophysics from what I remember. And um, anyway, he said that he, he kind of disappeared into obscurity. You can still find him there. I found him online and that's how I got the interview. He disappeared and because he found, he said that he found a vortex in the, in the, in New Jersey, in the forest, in which you can pass through to go to different dimensions and to kind of travel through space. Obviously a really bold and crazy, uh, well, not crazy, really bold and quite out there proposition. Anyway, his story gets deeper. He, he now believes that he's half human, half alien. So his dad was an alien. His, his mum was impregnated by an alien. Um, and he's half alien half human so so obviously people are going to probably listen to this and laugh their head off but i thought i'm going to speak to this guy he seems to be quite an interesting character not just to kind of i, I was very sensitive very aware not to make it well what you don't do is mock stuff. people yeah, exactly yeah because yeah. he's very sometimes to go look at this freak ha 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 look ha. at this freak because he had a lot of he was on tv a lot in the 90s and was interviewed so he had a bit of a persona you know he wasn't a random guy that i'd met in co-op um and anyway, the conversation was absolutely fascinating. And he said that he received a letter from NASA in the 90s saying like, yo, you've uncovered something, like you stop now. And he was saying that he passes through the vortex. I was asking him loads of questions about the vortex. And he, he proposed loads of big conspiracy theories, I guess, like stuff like uh, they're building a new, there's a parallel earth. There's a, there's a vortex in America and there's a parallel earth in which is totally desolate. It's like Earth like hundreds of thousands of years ago. And he said that all the hundreds of thousands of people that go missing every year, they're going through the vortex to to start building this new world. And I was like, whoa, this is so interesting. Like as, a, as a, an interesting thought experiment. And he said that, you know, it's not just scientists and bankers. They want pe- one of everybody. Like and Noah's Ark. Like Noah's Ark, yeah. exactly. And, and they're building this new world because this world's fucked because of, you know, all the stuff we've done with the climate and everything. And then I looked into the figures of the amount of people that go missing every year and it is pretty astounding, you know. I'm not saying that they've gone through the vortex, but I thought that's a cool, that is an interesting This would make a great documentary film. It would. You should follow up on it, man. Thanks, man. And, and then, and then it, it got weirder because I started afterwards, I started Googling a lot of things that he said. I thought this guy's waxing lyrical. He's, you know, he's he's pulling spin- quotes from other places. He's just being, he's just, he's, you know, I thought he might be going through some kind of psychotic episode and just saying anything. But a lot of what he said was based in truth, and no wonder people's imaginations run wild. Because, for example, he said the pen- the Pentagon have got have spent ten trillion dollars with no receipts over the past ten years. Over the last 10 alone. That's what he said to me. And I was like, okay, he's just, he's just making something up. I Googled it and, and it's true. It was on Reuters. The, the Pentagon in America cannot account for $10 trillion worth of expenditure over the past 10 years. Okay. And he said that it's going to, a, to build this new world, which is through a, you know, a vortex. I don't believe that. But where has it gone? Mm. Maybe the reality is much scarier, which is yeah, on fucking yeah, yeah. warheads and all sorts of weird shit, and like dangerous stuff. So that was true. And then I found, he sent me a letter that he was sent by NASA. It looked a bit, it looked like it was forged, but I thought, you know what? Like it had a spelling mistake. And I thought, would NASA make a spelling mistake? Would they? I don't know. So I thought, do you know what? I'm going to look into this letter, see, see its legitimacy. I Googled, the department was called something that seemed weird it was like the department for um it was something like the the department for astro astrological discovery and right. i was like that sounds made up yeah you know i googled it. it was it was real it is real now and it is it was real in in the early thousands when he got sent sent it and i googled the person's name who sent it to him and they did work there uh they did work there at the time and I sent a freedom of information request to NASA to say, hi, you don't know me, but I'm a journalist. And someone I was interviewing received this letter, which says, you know, 
He's called Sarjal 18. His name is Sergeant of Light 18. So I said, this guy said that he's received this, this letter, this... Um, a it's cease like, and desist, basically. It was, was it? basically saying you, you've uncovered too much. Stop now, otherwise we'll we'll, we'll take it further, or your life's at risk. Something yeah. like really threatening. Yeah, yeah. Seemed really out of character for NASA. <laughs> and I said, guys, what? Yeah, yeah. And I sent it to um, Freedom of Information request, saying, why would you email this guy? I said his real name. On this date, what were you referring to? Um, and can I, you know, can I request that information? I was willing to pay $100, $100 for it, but they never got back. There you go. They never got back. And so... It's like when you dig deep as well. The deeper you go, the more you uncover, the more I started you believing start. what I was saying. Exactly. You're like, well, maybe this is all true. You yeah, know? well, do you know what? The part of, part of me... Uh, yeah, part the more of me you learn, like the that. less strange it seems kind of thing. The more I learned, like, The 10 trillion, I was blown away, blown away by it. I was like, that is, that is like unbelievable. And then... To be honest, I uncovered. I felt a little bit like a counselor at one point, so I felt out of. Did my he depth. have psychological? He had. He, he suffered from mental health. Uh, mental health. You know, poor mental health. He suffered. He, he told me. He told me. I felt out of my depth. At, w- at one point, he said, which is in the article, he says um, his stepdad used to beat him up a lot. Uh, right. Which was we, we got really deep and really dark. His stepdad used to beat him up a lot. Uh, his dad. His stepdad was like in his words, criminally insane. Um, and it's, I said, How, what was that like? You know, that must have been difficult. And he said, when he did, I just closed my eyes and I, and I went to these imaginary places. I, I made a whole imaginary world in my head. So it's just post-trauma stuff he's describing. And he goes, that's what I used mechanism. to do. That's what I used to do. I used to go to these imaginary worlds and that's what got me through. And as he was saying it, in his next breath, he was like, anyway, I was tested on by the US government and I was, and all the, all these crazy, all these like, bold claims. Yeah. And I thought, perhaps, I'm no psychologist, but perhaps. He was abused as a kid. and Perhaps he, he the escapism of, of what, how he used to cope with the, the abuse when he was a kid, perhaps he's taken that into adult, adult life. Yeah. Perhaps his life isn't so interesting and it isn't how he thought it would be. So maybe, you know, being half human, half alien is actually mine interesting and that actually explains why he was beaten up so much by his dad stepdad why why he didn't fit in in school why he got bullied all these all these different elements of his life can be explained if he was a half human half alien hybrid that was tested on by the u.s government what's what what what, um website is that article for or with it's on prohibited which is a um prohibited p-r-o-h-b-t-d there we go so um, if people want to follow you, because this, I mean, there's so there's much a lot of stuff, stuff that we haven't here. gotten into as well. <laughs> if people want to follow you, you're on Twitter and Instagram. And have you got like a personal Facebook that's like a public one? Or is it just no. Twitter and Insta, is it? Or just Twi- Instagram? Twitter and Instagram, yeah. J-A-K, J-A-K underscore T-H. Jack. That is my name. Jack underscore Thomas Hutchcraft. There you go. Hutchcraft is such like a science fiction author's surname as well, isn't it? Jack Hutchcraft. It's an incredible name. Um, So let's talk about my band. Let's talk about your band. um, And there's no real easy way of going into this. So I'm just going to kind of go in if that's okay. Uh Um, You lost your bass player Mm -hmm. before the release of the album, which you'd written with him, right? And recorded. Did you record it together? Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if you don't mind going there, if you wouldn't mind explaining um, what happened. Well... I'm not going to go into the details of exactly what happened, but yeah, we've been together for, we'd been together for about five years, always the same lineup. We're called Waco. Um, and we played all over London, played around Europe and we had a great time. I saw you supporting Juliet Lewis and the Licks. Yes, you did. Yeah. What, what a great time that was. Um, and then, and then sadly just before last Christmas, so December, 2018, um, our bassist Chris sadly passed away tragically, and you know, out of the blue, he passed away. It was an accidental death, and um, we we were. It was heartbreaking. It still is really, really heartbreaking. It's very difficult when. I mean, you guys were all best friends. It wasn't like you yeah. were a loose group that had kind of you know, got together to just make music, and that was the extent of your social interaction. We did. You were brothers, right? Absolutely, yeah, uh, brothers, and we we. Um, did a lot together. We did, did everything together, and it was difficult because 
it's a little bit, it's different. It's like losing a best friend rather than just losing a friend or someone you know, because we spoke every day and I can't, I, I can't, um, you know, emphasize this en- enough. We spoke every day. We have a group chat as, with the band. We talk, share memes, share songs, talk about plans for the future, talk about song ideas, everything. We did it all day, every day, pretty much, because it's such a big part of our life. So when he left this world, when he died, it's uh, it was a really, really big thing. And it still is a really, really big thing. So we had a moment of, we had, we had a, a while of just kind of mourning and gathering our thoughts. And then, you know, last year, James, an old friend of mine, offered, because we had some, we had gigs booked as well. We, we recorded the album with him. We wrote the album. This is our debut album. We've been together for quite a long time, but we've you recorded put out EPs and EPs, singles and yeah, EPs and singles. Then we call this album. It was a really, really big thing, and it breaks my heart that he uh, didn't see it get released. He did hear it finished, and he absolutely loved it. And uh, he's just a sweetheart, just a just a salt of the earth, one of the best, kindest, most gentle, peaceful, funny guys you'd ever meet. But um. So he never got his saw. He never saw it get released. We had a few gigs booked, and then James jumped on bass. He was like, "Well, he didn't jump on bass." He said, "If you would like to play these gigs, um, I'm happy to step in." Which is, which is a very that's a daunting, very quite heavy task, isn't it? Totally. And we weren't. We didn't even know if we wanted to continue the band. Did you have that conversation? Did you sit down and discuss the the future and yeah. the possibility of not well, continuing? Well, do you know what we actually thought? Was we, that ever an option? Or we, did you always want to see it through for his memory? And We always wanted to release the album. We didn't think we'd be still going as a band. But we were like, uh, that was the last thing on my mind. Oh, yeah. And then we got a, a kind of a blessing from Chris's family, which was like, they were like, okay, next time you play in Birmingham, come and stay at our house. But what? Next time you play in Birmingham? I was thinking, what? Like, well, Chris is gone. And they were like, you're going to Is he from Birmingham, was he? He's from Coventry. Right. Um, so he's like, she was like well, of course you're going to continue the band and then then her, his mum saying that so candidly and so you know uh confidently i was like well yeah actually and it feels like the right thing to do it really really does it, we, we deliberated a lot and we we went back and forward but it really does because he put so much of himself into the band into getting us where we are into building our wonderful fan base and and the empire that we're building you know and the album that we made it'd be it all it'd be shit for us we realized and for kind of his legacy to stop especially when the album hadn't even come out yet so we thought you know what let's do it for chris let's do it in memoriam kind of in tribute to him let's do these last few gigs and then things worked out really well with james he fit in because he's an old friend of mine and then we started writing new music because I was like, you know, what? like it felt like a very useful thing to do with our with our grief. Of to course. Ch- to channel it into creativity. Yeah, of course. It's kind of, I channel everything into the creativity, whether it's happy or sad, you know, whether it's anxiety or relief or whatever it is, I channel it in there. We all, we all do in the band. So for this, it kind of naturally was like, I had a natural... Um, compulsion to start making music again like and sing it almost sing about it you know I didn't want to you know do big cheesy tribute songs but I thought I kind of want to I kind of want to channel this energy I don't know what to do with this sadness Um, and so I we started writing new music and before no one knows this but before our album came out um, Human Magic we've written and recorded a second album wow yeah, yeah, we recorded, written and recorded the second album throughout last year, and yeah, it, it's um, it's done, it's done, and it, I'm pretty, I'm really, really happy with it. And no one knows this, so this is exclusive business. But I thought I'd mention it on the podcast because we're actually looking for a label and a manager there and a booking go. agent. Right. <laughs> always hustling, yeah, man. Yeah, always hustling. Always so hustling. if anyone's listening and they want a manager, I want to well, let's work let's... with us in some capacity. We have got bounds of creativity and work know, ethic and work personality ethic, everything so you know this album we're going to get it out this year sometime fucking a, on, man. on on a label on a another label and it's going to be a triumphant tribute again we're all doing it in tribute to chris but it feels 
the right thing to do to move forward uh not move away from it but you know yeah to continue, continue to carry continue, on continue as it, as if he was here we'd still be continuing well i want to talk to you before we kind of jump ahead you've thrown a, an a exciting exclusive curveball at me there i didn't know that was the case i want to talk to you about a couple of the individual songs on the album yeah. because i love it i think it's Thank a great you. record i've always loved what you guys do i remember distinctly the first night i saw you play live which was the moment we were speaking about earlier on yeah. and there's very few bands in my life that i remember the, the night i saw them live for the first time and i remember connecting with you for the first time like because you just you had this energy on stage where you were just unusual you were just like as a band you're unusual like yeah. i've compared you i think i've probably spoken to you about this i compare you in a way to like ian jury and the blockheads not in terms of the way you sound yeah but just in terms of the way you look as a group just like these four really individual kooky looking dudes <laughs> yeah. how do these guys get together where do they meet what was the you know the kind of the the common thread yeah and there's this just a real original sound that you have which is a mixture of like kind of indie and rock and punk and you just like no band out there and i think Thank that's you, that's to your strength and perhaps has also been to your detriment in terms of the business and trying to navigate those seas because yeah. people are like well what are they what do they do no you, totally you know you like just this kind of psychedelic uh, you know qu quirky rock and roll band um there's a song on the fucking record is it lewisham lover Let's Lev the, Levensham, Lover. Levensham Lover. Yeah. What's that about? Because I know that you, you have always these great stories about what the songs <laughs> really kind of are informed by. Um, um, can so, we share any thoughts on that one? So Levenzoom is a place in Manchester. Okay. Of Manchester. And it's uh, it's just me dealing with a, a breakup, kind of. The lyrics in the chorus are... Maybe I should spend my time looking for something more than a Weatherspoons pub or my Levin Zoom lover. I've been speaking to ancient gods. They say I'm this way because I never grew up. Where's my Levin Zoom lover? So that's like, that's, uh, I felt pretty lost. And, uh, Is Cool and Garter a similar kind of a story as well? Off the yeah, yeah. So Cool and Garter, yeah. You've done your research. Is well, it's, I just listened to your music. So I, <laughs> I remember playing Cool and Garter when I was doing the Team Rock Radio Punk show a few oh, years yeah, back. I remember. And that's got the brass on it, that tune. Yeah. And that's probably my favourite of the kind of the early stuff, that song. And that seems to me to be about that idea as well, that existential yeah. lust and longing. and Yeah, man. Yeah. So that, so that, that is, you that... tap into that energy really, really kind of proficiently and well. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of... It's, Thank you very much. It, it's it's kind of a dance between trying to be confident, be self confident, stiff up a lip. This is okay. This is just a carnal interaction that no longer is happening. We are two humans on this earth that choose have chosen to not be together anymore. Uh, and me trying to rise above it, but obviously being pulled down by the emotions that lie within us all. You know, we're, we're all kind of inherently, um, you know, uh, hi hypocritical, kind of paradoxical in us. You know, one part of me is like, you know, fuck this. I'm, contradictory, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm contradictory, so yeah. So, so we are, one part of me is like, I'm fine. I was fine before all this. I'm fine. I can rise above these emotions. And the other part of me, it's just dragging me down. It's I'm a mess. It's ultimately what makes us human. Our, yeah, our emotions, they're, they're largely misunderstood and they're misleading, but they make us human. So I think it's good to tap into that and go like, hey, we all hurt sometimes, right? Everybody hurts. <laughs> um, what's the tune where you're singing about strippers advice at the weekend? That's the lyric which fucking got me the first time oh, I yeah. heard that. It's my favourite. Strippers don't like hearing career advice on the weekend. Never a truer word. <laughs> I've been that guy as well. Oh, really? Yeah, I've fallen in love with so many strippers. Like, I, can, <laughs> I can take you away from here. They're like, yeah. I'm fine, mate. I'm making loads of money. You're the idiot. You're like, oh, yeah, I am, aren't I? Yeah, you're right. I, I, remember, I remember it was a, it was a friend of a friend came out of a uh, strip club once and it was just like, oh... She told me to fuck off. I was like, why? I was like, I was trying to give her career advice. Yeah, I was like, brilliant. dude, I was like, <laughs> I was like, she probably makes, yeah, twice as much as you do. Oh, three times, more, yeah. if not more. I was like, a lot of people, you're the mug. People choose to be strippers. You know, obviously there is a bit of a dark, there, there can be darker, less safe parts of it. But 
I've got a stripper mate, and she's just I, like I she's know just many. Like, I used to work in a strip club, yeah, and I've got just many like, friends. Fuck you, man! Like, I'd rather do this it. and do some office job. Exactly. You don't yeah. need career advice. Yeah, yeah. Especially <laughs> the weekend. <laughs> and N15 is that a continuation of SE17? So N15, I live in N15. It's postcode. Right. N15. And, and SE17 was where you were previously residing, was it? Or SE17? Uh, yeah. It, it wasn't where I was previously residing, no. but it, it's... Uh... Where somebody else was. Exactly, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the, By the way, the listeners, Matt is, is, is I'm going raising deep. his eyebrows at me up and <laughs> um, So, uh, yeah, N15. So, yeah, that's... that's um... I'm just... So, my three favourite songs on the album is Levin Shlula, I don't know how you pronounce yeah. that. Levin Zoom. Levin Zoom Lover, N15 and Daydream. They're my three. Thanks, man. They're the Gems. slower ones, kind of. They, I'm, I'm that guy. I remember yeah. chatting to Josh on Alan Name Ballads. Drop when um, the, uh, what's the Red Queen to the Stone Age album that's got like My God is the Sun, Sat by the uh, Ocean. Songs for the Deaf? No, not that one. Oh. That is obviously a Red album. Um, the Vampire of Time and Money. Basically not the one that's just come out, but the one before that. Okay. And all the songs I was listening, the ones that I loved, he's like, these are all the very despondent, introspective, slow. They're just my jams. Thanks, man. I think I'm that guy, like in, in life. I'm Yeah. Do you know what, as well, I was actually talking about this yesterday. They, um, yeah, I... And that's what they, I like they, about they, what you do as it well. Allows a, uh, it allows space for a lot of depth in those songs. I think perhaps it's easier to get into those, deal with those deeper emotions, um, or for it to connect more because it, it, it's, uh, it's not shouting in your face. I, I feel that like, anyway. I feel that like with films as well. I feel that, like, you know, if a film can make me cry my eyes out, um, really, which I cry at m- most films, me even too. if it's not that sad. I'll yeah, cry. yeah. But, um, but if it makes me cry, it really sticks. With, like, in, and I really, I like the film. It's really well made. It kind of sticks with me, and it has a, dip, a special place in my heart more than if it's just an action or a comedy, like a banger. I, that 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 seems, yeah. yeah, it seems they seem more surface surface level. But if it can really hit me. In, Really, really hit me and make me and stay with you. Feel, yeah. Even if it's a comedy with sad parts, it's kind of. I think it must be hard to write, to write a film that can really stir an audience to tears. Like that, that is a really, a really amazing thing to do. Like, like effectively. Well, I was talking to you earlier on about this beautiful documentary that you made, which isn't out yet, but will probably be out by the time this goes out for, oh, Me- yeah. for Mencap. And there's a scene in it. So your bandmate and dear friend, Craig, and also I want to shout Craig out because he's a patron of this podcast. Yeah, yes, my Craig. Dude. <laughs> I was like, who the hell's Clive Bissell? Because he's, he's got a different name because he's obviously a teacher and stuff. Yeah. So he's got to be on the kind of Facebook radar. Yeah. Um, but he, so he, work, is, does he work or volunteer? So he's, a, he's, he's involved with. He's a support with, worker. Support worker at this, is it like a, a, an institution? No, is no. It a venue? It's a, it's a, it's a center. A center. So it's a bit like, a bit like a, a bit like a, a community a day, center, day center right? youth center kind of vibe but it's um it's for people who've who've got a learning disability um or a learning difficulty and uh so he's been working there for a long time i used to work there for a little bit i was a support worker there my job entailed um uh, picking people up taking them to the center the service users you know so people have got very different needs there um very different needs you don't no, you don't need to know often. You just you adapt just to how they it. are. Yeah, you adapt to, how, adapt to how they are and what needs they have. But, you know, everyone has the same, deserves the same rights and opportunities as, as neurotypical people. So that's what you call people who haven't got learning disabilities. Um, so, or mental health, or poor mental health, you call neurotypical. Uh, I don't mean to patronise you, by the way. You're not. Just saying it. Uh, good to know my friend I didn't know by that, the way patronising so. means when you talk down to somebody there you go <laughs> <laughs> you're so, not it's fine no. oh wait is it yeah <laughs> so so anyway so we made a documentary just about literally kind of shining a light on on uh, the realities of, of support work and living with a learning disability you and know, to, I guess to take away the stigma and the misconceptions and yeah, hum- and, humanize and have, these people in a way that they deserve to be Absolutely, viewed. and 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 a greater understanding of people and their needs and their experiences and their, and just their daily life. I think that that works towards a works towards a more inclusive society, which is what I'm ultimately working towards. You know, sh- trying to shed light on different areas of society, which perhaps you wouldn't know. So, if you don't have a if you don't work in the sector, or if you don't have a family member, family member or friend that has disabilities, 
then perhaps you would never know what it actually entails to to be a support worker or to to live daily life with you know with autism or with development or the difficulties delay. that people who do that people struggle face. with those things face such as you know sometimes simple tasks like as you say in the documentary can you go to the shop buy a pint of milk and get the right change yeah and things like this so like the, simple the world, tasks that perhaps we take for granted exactly and the world actually disables people rather than rather than them being a problem in our world uh there there a lot of the issues they face stem from our world being catered for people who are neurotypical and also people who are not wheelchair users who have got you know full mobility the world is made for those people therefore uh therefore we could we should move towards a world where it isn't as confusing to you know use the tubes or it isn't uh you can go if you if you use a wheelchair you can go to any tube stop you want you can get on any bus you want you can do all these things that we take for granted that Mate, i struggle on the tube yeah well, yeah the tube, this tube yeah. should just be easier full stop should be easy yeah. for everybody yeah <laughs> so so the documentary is hopefully yeah we spend it's pretty but pretty much a day in the life two days in the life of of the center just everything that goes the on clients there clients and the the support workers from yeah. both sides and yeah so the service users and the support workers we interviewed both you know we couldn't we couldn't tell the story without from, both yeah. without both because we asked people why they come to the center because some come two days a week one day a week four days a week some have been going for years um some just drop in sessions whenever they want some come for the dance class some come to play pool play you know whatever what what all these things where you would go to a community center, community center for, are available at this center, and I, I wanted to shed light on it because I think that we're all we all benefit from living in a more inclusive, more equal society. Everybody benefits from that, not just people with disabilities. Everyone benefits from that. And the reason I mention it, not just because it's great, which it is, is because <laughs> there's the scene where there's there's a lady and Craig and they're having a chat, and he asks her, "Does coming here make you happy?" And she's just got this beaming smile on her face. And she's like, yeah, yeah, it does actually. It makes me really happy. And I just, I start, I broke down and I just started welling up. I was like, that is one of the most moving examples of genuine happiness yeah, yeah. in such a simple experience. It, it moved the shit out of me. <laughs> nice, man. Thanks. It's thanks a lovely so- little film. It's about 17, 18 minutes long. Yeah, um, we're going to edit it What's the plan bit. for release? Uh, it, Do you know where just- it's going? Is it just going to be like YouTube or is there so- a specific site or... So it'll be on our it'll be on our Waco YouTube, I think. Nice. It's kind of because you've done the music as well. You've scored it. Yeah, we scored the music. Great little it, song, which brings it to life side. in a very joyful way. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I thought it, it's an upbeat song. It's the it, perfect that's the fit. Feel, that's the I thought it. you'd written it, as I said to you before we started. I thought you'd actually specifically written that song for the documentary. It nice. sounds so Taylor scored for the you know the subject matter. Thank you, man. Yeah, but yeah. it was just an living, old track knocking around. It was living <laughs> is easy when I've got you by my side. Yeah. That's that's the chorus lyric, so it kind of makes sense. It fits with the movie, and um, we're just going to release it. But we're going to do some stuff with Mencap because the, the the charity is Hammersmith and Fulham Mencap, uh, which is kind of a subsidiary, I guess, of 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 Mencap UK, which is a again a charity for people with a learning disability, which also supports their families and their carers too. So it doesn't just end in that centre; it, it extends out. Um, so it'll go through their channels as well. Hopefully, we can. Because even a lot of the service users, their families, friends, carers, they don't know exactly what happens in the centre. They they often work, so you drop them off. You know, you you drop your brother or son or friend off at the centre. You have to go to work all day. You come pick them up. So it was really good for everybody to see um, to see what you know the, behind what the curtain, actually, as behind it were, the curtain, yeah. what, what actually happens. And we did it. We did a, did a screen in there, and all of the trustees. Of the charity came to watch it, and I did a talk in front of it. Nice, in front of the um the, the showcase. And th- this is a film that you've directed. This one is, yeah. I I guess with with, with my friend Tally Clark. She's a uh, she's done some of our mu- Waco music videos, done most of them, and um, it was kind of both of us. Your and joint was, vision, yeah, 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 joint vision, and and we and I interviewed people, but I was off camera mostly, and. A lot of the relationships that I've I'd built through working there and through visiting a lot, yeah, I really helped me out in the film. As and having as Craig, of course, it would, yeah, and having Craig on board instead of being like, "Hi guys, can we film for a few?" And days? you come in as a stranger, yeah, yeah, that, that that doesn't really work in that setting. I, I don't think it would anyway. Well, there's the other bit where there's the couple, really sweet couple, yeah, 
and you you ask them, so, yeah, how's the relationship? And the guy's like, oh, it's all right. Yeah, and she <laughs> gives him a little dig. It's, that's like moments you see on like you know real life celebrity. Yeah. I don't know reality television isn't <laughs> yeah, it just totally. those beautiful little moments that he make just shrugs human, and goes like... <laughs> sh- he shrugs and goes yeah it's all right yeah. <laughs> and she goes oh come on and it's him <laughs> he's totally lovely little on. moment no thanks man yeah, i th- hope it um i hope people understand the vision again that was very it was quite difficult for me to i, I had a few moments where i thought you know i have to be very sensitive yes. very sensitive and very careful of how it comes across not to be exploitative uh-huh. not, and, and also it really, doesn't at all really any, reevaluate in my my intentions mm-hmm. you know why am i doing this and I, I just kept coming back to i think it is important for people to see and hear from people who've got different abilities you know i think that's so important especially with working not just there but i've worked in um special education schools before and unless you go there you really don't you really don't know you know how to interact with um with people who've got different needs different abilities so therefore hopefully you know our 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 film does a little bit more to open people's minds maybe well there's there's two different schools of journalism (laughs) right there's the one where the host or the personality or the the interviewer or the writer injects their own personality into it and then it can risk becoming an ego piece. Mm-hmm. What I've noticed from reading and watching all the work that you've done is you are a 100% objective documentarian. Okay. You're there on the quest to uncover and expose truth and present a scenario, yeah. uh, you know, an idea and then as it is a- in its purest form. So the reader and the viewer can take what they can from it. And I love that about what you do. There is no ego to what you do. Obviously, there is on stage. That's different. You're a rock and oh, roll yeah, star. Yeah. But when it comes to the journalism, I've really found that just in immersing myself in it today. I'm so used to these egocentric music journalists that are just My slating opinion, bands and like their opinion matters for fucking shit, which it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. And yours is just, no, I'm going to just immerse myself like a fly on the wall in this world yeah. and bring back what I can yeah. and, and present people who haven't been there and seen it firsthand exactly, with yeah. uh, you know, a, re- a recreation of it. And it re- absolutely thanks, man. It, and it's objective. Is that the goal? That's it. That's, that's the, goal. the goal. Be objective. People can make their own mind up if they think. If they think some of the um, uh, some of the people I interview are devils and uh, and what they believe is is wrong, then that's up to them. But at least I've presented both sides, somewhat. You know, tried to do it as best I can, uh, and then the reader can make their own mind up. I hope. I always do maintain that liberal mindset though. Um, and present present as I see it, how I'm received, how I'm welcomed, what I see. So if people, if luckily a lot of most of the people I speak to, are, they like me. Well, why. that's a great skill that you can't <laughs> teach. They like me. I'll, I'll You've be got to make with... people feel comfortable oh. around you and then they open up. That's what I do on this show. It's the same thing. It's yeah. like people, if they like you, they're going to trust you. They're going to go to those places. They're going to be themselves. Yeah. I've been, you know, I'm sitting in, I've sat in, you know, people's houses before interviewing them and talking about some stuff that their colleagues and friends and families don't know. And I think uh, I'm obviously lucky that I've got uh, people like me. They do. <laughs> For some reason. I like you, dude. I fucking yeah. love you. I loved you the day I met you. <laughs> I'm pleased that I know I you. I'm yeah. pleased that we're friends. Thanks, man. I rate you as a human, as a creative the new album, is that going to be out this year then, do you think? Waco's number two year. record, 100%. It's going to be out this year. and Love it. Uh, it's, it's really special and it's, it's, it's ambitious. Well, the last one was. <laughs> it was really <laughs> ambitious. I can't wait. Mate, I it's, can't it's wait. Good, it's good fun, yeah. I took my mates to see you live at the, uh, the Old Blue Last and they were like, what is this band? Like one minute, it's one thing, the next, it's like Ennio Morricone, <laughs> like Western... <laughs> Yeah. surf rock kind of it was just it's a very expansive thing you've got going on and Thanks. um i'm pleased to hear that it's getting wider well it, Bring is, it, it just that doesn't mean to go on that's it, it isn't it go. and dude what a pleasure and waco where do people find waco the band online on the social media platforms okay so waco w-a-c-o named after the famous siege in texas the famous town in in texas uh w-a-c-o waco waco band.co.uk that's our website you can find us on spotify the album's called human magic uh, come and see us live 
do go see them live because they're wicked. Become fun. our manager, become our booking agent, <laughs> sign us to your label, whatever. Book us for a gig, I don't mind, we'll play anywhere. I'm just happy to be playing still. And uh, after all we've been through, it feels so important to keep going. Right on, dude. This has been an absolute delight. <laughs> Cheers Best for coming on. Best birthday ever, man. That's it. Happy birthday. birthdays. Choosing to spend it with me on my show. <laughs> what a treat. Cheers, man.